Hi guys, I'm Brad and welcome to The Great Hollywood Rewrite, where we take a look at some of cinema and TV's most troublesome titles and have a poke around under the hood. I'm joined by John today. Hi John. Hello Brad. Uh, This week our audience selected the film Star Wars Episode 1, The Phantom Menace from 1999, written and directed by George Lucas. But before we attempt to negotiate terms with an interstellar trade federation, if you haven't done so already, check out our website, thescriptdepartment.net, for all our latest projects, including script readings from our international network of screenwriters. Also, you can follow us on social media, hit the links in the description, and subscribe to our podcast. Just search for The Script Department wherever you get your podcasts for daily episodes. So, John, this is a big one, The Phantom Menace. Um, one of the most hyped films of all time. Um, like unheard of levels of expectation around this film. People queuing for month, a month or so to get their tickets. People buying tickets for films like Meet Joe Black to go in and see the trailer and then leaving <laughs> just so they could see the trailer. Um, it made a massive amount of money. Still, I think, the sixth highest grossing film of all time but it's arguably flawed in quite a few ways and possibly a victim of its own success, of the franchise's success. How do you feel about this sometimes divisive uh, entry into the franchise? Uh, You know, I'm a big defender of the prequels. I love the prequels. I think they're the Star Wars films I enjoy watching the most because they do the most to... They work the hardest to expand the universe and inspire the imagination, I think, in ways that the originals just, you know, were logistically not able to do for various reasons. Um, But I, there are aspects of this that, you know, I completely get that, you know, yes, I, I, it's not that I'm blind to the problems in these films, in the, in, in the prequel trilogy in general, but this is definitely the one with the most, um, screenwriting related issues you know a beautiful film visually aesthetically uh really is one of the most beautiful ones to look at i mean if you ever you can take any random still from the film and it does have a beautiful aesthetic to it that would rival you know a spielberg movie of that period um you know you can tell that you know if you've ever watched the documentary that was on the dvd and i think it's on youtube now that you can watch the it's like a 90 minute documentary about the making of Phantom Menace, you can see the, the the real labor of love that went into making every aspect of it, um, a real physical production, not just, you know, dominated by green screens or anything as the sequel, as the other ones would be. But from a writing point of view, there are just a lot of issues here. And, you know, just uh, when I, I used to always, years ago, when I was kind of trying to learn screenwriting first, I used to always keep a little notepad with me when I'd be watching movies. And if I ever saw a little technique or whatever that I thought was cool, I'd write it down and make a note of it. Um, And I remember just watching Phantom Menace and deciding, okay, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to keep a tally of everything that I think is good. I'm going to put a little, uh, a little mark and everything I think is, you know, like, yeah, that's bad writing or whatever. I'm going to put another mark. And you know, just my own, you know, just being my own observations. And when the film was finished, there was, I did a count and it was the count for good stuff in the movie was one more than bad stuff on my tally. Like that's how, um, you know, so in in my mind, it was a good film, but barely a good film, you know? So I don't know. And I don't want to be too harsh, but it's got its issues. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I think it's, uh, it was a weird phenomenon. I think people still call, call the, the thing being phantom menaced that you, there was this huge, huge, like almost like religious, like build up to it. There were like people crying, walking through the door to see it. Like that they, they'd made it. It was happening. It was nearly 20 years since the last one. People have been begging for a decade and a half for it to happen. And, it it did well financially. It did well, and some of the concepts and ideas in it were great. I mean, I we're both huge fans of Lucas. Like, I'm so thankful that he exists. That we had we've we've had all of these pearls of like amazing narrative um, storytelling from him. Um, but this is one of the films where it's it's suffered from. I guess you could say the auteur effect where it's just all of his big ideas. They've just, everyone's just said yes to. Whereas in the original, a new hope, which he is the only, which is the last one prior to this, that he both wrote and directed. 
he was surrounded by people that were inputting because a, a film isn't about a single person. And when it is at times, this kind of thing can happen where it's like an interesting setup of some great ideas and spectacular set pieces, but the thread holding it together is tangled and it's not clear. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I, I, I think that's what's happened potentially. I, with this. I, I also think you know absolutely he is he was surrounded by people who who um you know work directly for his company it's not a case that he has hired a company and you know we're going to have constructive discussions or anything this is very much they work for him and they will do what he wants to do and there's nothing wrong with that but you i think you need to be able to i think have the skill to be able to step back and look at your work objectively, maybe more objectively than maybe he was able to. Um, I don't know. I'm just speculating. But look, I mean, I, you know, there, like I said, I mean, for every thing that I would have an issue with in this film, there is an aspect of this film that I really love as well. Um, and, and it is a film I will continue to watch. There are, there are films that I see issues in that I will never watch again. Uh, but there, but Phantom Menace is a film I will go back to. One thing I will say I think is, and it's from a screenwriting point of view, is, you know, there's an old kind of expression in screenwriting, come in late, leave early in a story. And A New Hope works so well because we are coming in late to this story. You know, Obi-Wan has had his battles, as we're currently seeing on TV. He, and, and Luke is not a, a child, uh, a 10-year-old child. He is, you know, looking to get out there now in the world and make a name for himself and, and have a life. Um, everybody has some lived experience and even the film itself was praised for having that kind of used universe aesthetic to it we've come in late phantom menace everything is clean everything is polished and everybody is young and everybody's inexperienced and we're coming in very early and sometimes that is uh, to the detriment of a story uh, i always said the prequel trilogy should have started with attack of the clones where this relationship has existed between Anakin and Obi-Wan for a while. We don't need to know how they met. It's just you're the guy who was assigned to me and I'm going to take care of you. And, and, it's, and, and we go from there. And maybe we get one more film after Revenge of Sith maybe or something or we spread out Revenge of Sith a little bit longer. Phantom Menace is the, is the story that I don't feel we need to know uh, in this whole chapter. And there are people who watch these films and don't watch Phantom Menace. Um, they've they've created their own structure to this story, and Phantom Menace yeah, is, I think is it's expendable. Called the, um, I think it's called the Machete Order. Yeah, <laughs> the order you watch them in is the Machete Order, and you don't have Phantom Menace, which I think's unfair. I mean, I quite like. I like actually, I do like this film. I know it's controversial to say so. I was swept up in the hype, and it was one of the last films to that I remember that really wasn't promoted that much online because it was 1999. Yes, the internet existed, but it was like AOL chat rooms and things like that. It wasn't, you know, Apple trailers and all what everything we have now. So the trailers were in the, the theater and they weren't pushed out online as they are now because they primarily wanted to keep things in the cinema as, as they, they still even do now. Um, but like you were saying, come in, come in, uh, late and leave early. Yes, that could have solved a lot of issues here. I think what what was he was trying to do was show this bloated republic that was ripe for falling. He wanted us to see Rome. He wanted us to see Constant Constantinople. He wanted us to see that. Great. I li I like that thread of it. That it's like this is how it happened. And I know you've got. And we've spoken about your opinion on the rise of Palpatine and the way it's done and in the calculated manner, it's great. Yeah. But and and, I, and I, the thing I love about the, the, the Palpatine, as I spoke about in our Obi-Wan review, is it is the long game that he's playing that I love. And I, and I do love that there's a 10-year gap between Phantom Menace and Attack of the Clones because that means Palpatine has been at war. Like, even if Palpatine's been playing this for hundreds of years or whatever, how old he is, I don't know. Um, the The... If the if the if the if the starter pistol on this plan is if the pulling the trigger on this plan is the trade blockade on Naboo at the beginning of Phantom Menace, then he knows there's going to be ten years. I'm going to have to wait where we're just biding our time before we pull the next trigger, before we press the next button. You know, and I love that idea. So even if we were to do my whole thing of coming late and leave early and that kind of stuff, 
uh, I think we'd lose that. We'd lose the, the brilliantly evil dedication that the villains in the story have to their plan that is successful. You know, so, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, th- I, th- I think it's an important thread to the the wider uh, universe of Star Wars. I just think it could have been handled in a different way. I mean, we've got we've got five five sort of loose loose areas to to chat about, and that is one of them. Um, Number one on my list is the 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 way they've handled the mysticism. So they've sort of diminished it a little bit with the introduction of um, midichlorians and like uh, the hegemony that go, going on in the the galaxy. Like it's it, there's a there's a dryness they've bought into the mysticism that's they're trying to explain in it, explain the whole thing. But then they 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 talk about a pro- the prophecy. And then don't lean into it. So it's it, it doesn't go one way or the other. So the mysticism suffers a little bit, compared, particularly compared to the A New Hope and the rest of the original trilogy. Um, number two is, as we've already said, too much politics. You know, it's a little bit of a snore fest with the um, the trade embargo, um, and you know the Senate speeches. There's far too much sitting around, and people listening to other people uh, talking and walking about rooms and stuff like that. It's you you need to balance that. You can have that, but you need to balance it with other stuff. Um, you know, we 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 there could have been more drama uh, to unseat Chancellor, uh, Chancellor Valorum. Like the, it just it just felt like it was just a, a little bit flat. Um, third one is Darth Maul. He, there's not enough of him. He's awesome, and then he's dead. Like <laughs> it's that everyone wanted more of Darth Maul. He was great. And they didn't. It, it didn't necessarily get. We didn't des- necessarily get enough of him. We are aware that he's not dead in the canon yes. after that movie. Yeah, yeah. So, I know so, we're going to make comments on that. But he was dead in George Lucas's mind at the end of that movie. Um, so he was yeah. created for this film, and yeah. the, the intent for him in the narrative of this film was him to be killed. So yeah, I mean, rebels and all the legend stuff, and uh, sorry, Clone Wars and all the re- uh, rebels legend stuff and all the comics and all that kind of stuff yes he was in that for one reason because he was amazing (laughs) no one wanted him dead so they yeah in the same way that they in the same way they resurrected boba fett they uh it's almost like yeah it's validation that actually it is a uh yeah he was a great character and again a lucas property so thanks thanks george lucas for him um so the number four is the i guess the nature of the the tone of it there's there's a there's a very childlike nature to a lot of the film so if you look at the gungans the combat droids you know an individual character like jar jar binks watto and anakin specifically um the, there are some unusual choices made with how they're portrayed uh the their sort of tone as in uh, you, you know for for example Anakin's a slave but he's quite a happy little boy um and that you know there are questions around uh having the two main combatants in the war have, have having been comic relief through the whole film up to that point you know there are there are certain questions around the the, the childish tone of the film um and the last one is uh, character motivations so other than Palpatine uh there isn't a lot of you know agency in this there isn't a lot of driving motivations for these characters yes they are fulfilling roles that they've been given um but they are so almost going through the motions of what they're supposed to be rather than pushing against the grain and trying to find uh, you know clarity or uh, you know to have their own hero's journey or what whatever they need to do there is there isn't enough of that and because of that we don't really have a clear protagonist which you know the film suffers from slightly um so these are the points that we're going to discuss if we go back to the first one which is the mysticism and what they do with the midichlorians and then talk about the prophecy but don't really go into it and the jedi seem quite dry and al- almost you know too dry quite boring in, in in you know with the council meetings and how they are trying to uh, negotiate diplomacy and things like this yes we know they do that that's that's part of their job but they're also warriors um and they train hard and you know there's a there's there's something lacking in there what what do you how do you feel about how they portray the mysticism in this um it does feel you know it's it's almost like uh you know you've seen this person out in the field and 
Uh, you know, do you ever see that joke? You know, sometimes in Family Guy, they make that joke where it's, uh, you know, Joe Swanson, the police officer, will say, oh, you know, that that would never be, you know, he'll be commenting on some cop movie like Die Hard and he'll say the amount yeah. of paperwork that you would have to do, you know, and, all that. and you know, it's almost <laughs> like saying that, you know, th- this job isn't as exciting as we, you thought it was because you saw some guy flying around with a lightsaber in a previous movie. Um, it's almost like everybody signs up to, to become a Jedi. And then they're all disappointed when they when they realize, oh, it's it's um, it's council meetings and, uh, you know, um, <laughs> all that kind of stuff. You know, oh, we're not we're keepers of the peace. Oh, we're not. War- we're not soldiers. Oh, I thought we were. You know, so there's um, there's a, a little bit of a disconnect, I think, between what the expectation and the anticipation of what Jedi life is versus what um, we get. And in this film now in in other films it's it's different because there's a war going on and there's investigations and mystery and so on but in this it's very yeah it's council meetings and it's science it's midichlorians and things like that um the midichlorians obviously is a little bit of a misstep because it it is explaining something that didn't need to be explained it's like explaining how spirituality work or how god works or something like that you know if if god exists in your you you know in your movie or whatever or um or a god exists in your story explaining how all that stuff happens can just you know really just rob us of of the of the of the escapism of it um my understanding is that the midichlorian i think a lot of people when they when they saw the film they thought oh the force is the midichlorians it's just all of these things. But then I feel like, it, if memory serves, it was explained later somewhere that the midichlorians are the thing that allow you to be able to communicate with the Force. So I think a lot of people felt they had explained the Force away as this scientific thing. And instead, I think maybe it was either retcon or maybe it's in Phantom Menace, but I think the actual explanation now, at least, is... The midichlorians are just that thing in your body. It's like that cell count in your body or something that allows you to be more susceptible to communicating with the force. Mm. So when you so say that, that was a, that was in, an interesting decision because it, it didn't mm. need to happen. Oh yeah, like, yeah, yeah. We don't need to know really. I mean, it's a microbial life. I think effectively, like it's it's almost sounds like venereal disease. Or something. It's it's like what? Where does it come from? Like, how do they do they catch it? Like, does someone sneeze it into them? Like, is there you know? The, so so that that whole the the need to scienceify it, let's call it. Yeah, that's what we're calling it, and um, scienceifying it. The reason the need to do that felt too much. It was almost like it, it, we wanted to see the organization and the culture of the Jedi, and that I don't know that didn't need to be in it's, there as far as I'm concerned. It's say. answering a question that no one asked. We don't we don't ask. Like if if you believe in a god, if you believe in um miracles and things like that, that's great. Uh but I don't think when somebody feels like they've experienced a miracle that they're asking, okay, how did that thing happen? Okay, so my 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 illness is now in remission. Oh wow, it's a miracle. But I wonder how spiritual or how my spiritual faith has affected my cells and so on. Like nobody's asking that question. You don't think like that. We don't think like that. We we there is a leap of faith in life sometimes, and the force is very much a leap of faith. You can imagine Jedi jumping off high buildings sometimes in a chase or something in the hopes that the force will protect them. You know, um, and this does feel like we don't need a leap of faith anymore. I've got a scanner and it says you're you're good to go, you know? And I feel it's the sim- solution is simple. Cut midichlorians altogether. It doesn't affect the story. And if you want proof that Anakin is, well, he's way better than Yoda, you just ha- need to have him do something. You know, actions speak louder than words. And right now we're getting a lot of words. Yeah, I, I think there are plenty of other ways they could have tested Anakin, even if it's get him to hold a kyber crystal and it floats in his hand or it goes green or whatever. Just something a little bit more organic rather than like kind of kind of like a a, a, a midichlorian COVID test that he's taken there. And it's just like, it just feels a little, yeah, they could have done that in a different a number of different ways. But imagine the mother being in danger and he saves his mother. In the mm. same way Grogu saves 
uh, Mando in Mandalorian. You know, just have yeah. some have something like like what's going to bring out the Force more than a ten year old boy watching his mother in peril. You know, and it could be something as simple as like you know, slave life is a dangerous life because they do tiptoe around all that a little bit. Um, it's a dangerous life, and she is risking her life when she does her job every day for some you know whatever it might be. And there's no safety. They don't care about it. You know, we don't care about them. Or, you know, the Watto and all them don't care about them and all that. And then, and then Anakin saves her. And Qui-Gon goes, holy crap, you know? Um, yeah, so I, th- I, think, I think that's quite in- interesting because there's a level of uh, Christian theology in this, um, just the way that it's presented with the Immaculate Conception. And I can see that they're, they're following, they're following the, the, le- the nature of that. But this isn't... A biblical text it's a film so you know the the passion of christ doesn't focus on baby jesus it, just, it it focuses on the time in his life when he you know he became this mystic character and this 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 leader i know that's what we're building up to by seeing him as a child but that doesn't mean that we can't have any of his you know his the cornerstone of his magic abilities appear at this age like why can't he present like as a as a child you know there are plenty of uh shots of the the younglings in the jedi temple practicing and making things float and you know why can't why can't he do that why is it just a test like why can't we sit like you say he he could save his mother he could do something he they could be living safely in slave life because he can do these things but he's keeping them a secret because p- he's worried about people thinking and the midi the, mid- the midi chlorians the midi chlorians is only in this universe to sh- so that qui-gon can justify bringing this boy away that's mm. it that's it it's just how do we know he's the one um uh, the midi chlorians say so and i think this needs to be more action based it needs to be even you know like he how does how does uh you know how does this boy win so many pod races mm. like actually he's never won a pod race before that's the problem isn't it and padme is like oh god this is a bad bet um and it's and it's no actually he should be winning every pod race because he's cheating because he is the future Darth Vader. So there's a little bit of a dark streak in him. He is a little bit dishonest. He cheats a lot. He does it so he can win money for his mother. He's, you know, there's a beautiful kind of undertone there. This is a guy who cheats all the time to win his races. And all the other pod races hate his guts because of it. And they can't yeah. touch him because he's protected by Watto. And it's just this wonderful relationship where you get special treatment because you because you don't want to go too dark on the slave stuff because you're a kid. This is a kid's movie as well, remember? Mm. So you get special treatment because you are the guy who wins everything. And I know you've got some special trick up your sleeve, you know, and I've been protecting you from the Jedi. I don't want the Jedi to know you're here because you make a lot of money for me. And then Qui-Gon's just like, all right, enough is enough of this. Nice. Uh, yeah, I, go, I, like, you know, I like I you know. like the sort of uh, the the... I guess dirtying Anakin up a bit, yeah, like make, making yeah. him a slave child. Like you know, he's he's gonna have had a hard life. I think I think we'll talk more directly about Anakin in a few points time. But if we, if we if we try and lean into the the mysticism here, like if 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 we remember like the quotes about the Force from the original trilogy about it being connecting, you know, every you know to parts of uh, all life, and we are luminous beings, and all this kind of stuff, and they talk about the the prophecy and that this this child is going to fulfill the prophecy but other than the blood test or whatever it is they do there's nothing there like there needs to be some sort of poetry in motion to make them believe that this is part of their sacred script which we get nothing on now we get nothing on the the religion which arguably it is the theology let's call it um of the jedi way and it would be nice to get, I mean, we get, because we then get books in uh, The Last Jedi, it's like, what? Four, four, four of them. <laughs> four books. <laughs> and, you know, he's made a temple kind of thing out of them in a tree. And it's like, that that would have made, and I, and I know it's written afterwards, but that, that could have been much more if we had have looked at the, the ancient text of the Jedi and what it means and why he thinks this child is going to fulfill the prophecy is the saving of his mother and the winning of something. And is this the poetry in motion of reading the text and going, look, 
He's doing it right there. That's the guy. And, you know, this is a, it's a trope, but it's a trope because we, we, it makes sense to us, to the, the, particularly on the hero's journey that some of them try and go on in this film. Like there is, uh, there is a nature that we're familiar with here that we could have leaned into where they have a, a, a worded prophecy that they can lean into and go, look, this is it. If you um, uh, you know, as you're describing this, I'm thinking of Dune, the um, the yeah. the latest um incarnation of that film, of that story, and there's a wonderful moment early on where I mean, you see um Atreides, the uh, Timothy Chalamet's character, having these flashes of um, you know, he's having all these dreams and, and things are being a bit strange, and then he is questioned by the head of this holy order, and. It's it's very it's actually quite reminiscent of Yoda questioning mm-hmm. uh, Anakin and in the council. But the difference here is it's very dark. First of all, obviously, it's only a very different film. But um, he said she says something to him. Do you, do the things you dream about happen uh, exactly as uh, uh, as you've dreamed them? And and he says not all the time. And it's mm. a wonderful line that kind of sets up this kind of ambiguity about where he's going, you know, and like how much you can trust these flashes that he's having and all that. And it's really wonderful. Um, something like that is so would be so much more interesting where you're you're leaning on these these beliefs from the past, you know, and and you're and and you know, and they're having similar arguments. I mean, it's no surprise that uh, Dune was a huge inspiration for Lucas, but. Um, Noting many of the uh, June Star Wars crossovers yeah, that yeah. we've spoken yeah. about, the script department there, there's about twenty so far, I think. But we're but, uh, but even even more. even that scene, I, I don't know if that how accurate it is to the book, but that scene is so similar to the kind of stuff that you're getting in Phantom Menace. So maybe something that leans more on on the kind of stuff they did in June uh, to to establish a mythology, to establish a history, and to establish where these characters could could be going. And the ambiguity of where they could be going, because um, Qui Gon isn't going to recruit this kid if he knows he's the destruction of the Jedi. Um, but maybe there's ambiguity about the path that he could go down. He could go down a dark path. He could go down a light path as well. You know. Um, so yeah, I think yeah, yeah, I mean, you, you, yeah. you got to you got to dig into the mysticism. Absolutely. Yeah. But I, I think there was probably a. Uh, uh... I don't know, they probably stepped away from it a little bit because arguably what does bringing balance to the force mean? Does it mean destroying all of the people on the light side so there's an equal amount on each side? <laughs> like, you know, there are different ways of reading into that and the fact that there was a hubris from the Jedi to go, oh yeah, it's going to bring balance. What, so there's equal dark and light? Is that, is that what balance is? <laughs> but that whole explanation of balance, to, you know, the idea was, oh, you were supposed to bring balance to the force. And then it's like, ah, oh, no, it's Luke is the one who's supposed to bring balance to the force. Okay. But that was all something that the audience interpreted. That was all stuff that was created through fan theories afterwards. It, well, I remember having conversations with friends of mine in film school, you know, when Revenge of the Sith came out. And we were talking about how, um, you know, oh, it's not Anakin who's the, who's the chosen one. It's Luke is the chosen one. He's the one that's going to bring balance back to the force. And Anakin was just a stepping stone along the way. And, and, and now it's, well, maybe Ray is the one who brings back, you know, and all of these, all of these, these are fan theories because it's never actually explained in the, mo- in, in the movies what we mean by balance. Exactly, you know? and, and and I mean ba- and balance again, is equal measures of two things, right? And it's to wipe out the dark, to only have the light isn't balance, as far as it's, that's not balance. So yeah, there's I think I think there's interesting readings of the prophecy as well. So it would have helped to lean in, a, in just a tiny bit more, just but a also, little bit. If 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 they need a chosen one to bring balance, shouldn't they be able to predict that? What well, this is the age of the Jedi. Maybe the chosen one refers to the age of the Sith. Mm. Like, shouldn't they be aware of that? Because it's it's almost like if you know if you had some sort. Of, I mean, this is a stupid analogy, but if you had I don't know some device that will bring balance to the weather, let's say, right? And it's like, well, it's really sunny outside. Well, if we switch this machine on, it's obviously going to start raining. You should be yeah. able to just predict what it's going to do 
based on where we are right now. And it doesn't seem like there's any real danger in the galaxy or conflict mm. in the galaxy. Everything is beautiful and pristine, Naboo and so on, um, and for and Coruscant and everything. So surely there should be a big red flag that if you found a chosen one to bring balance to the force, because he's gonna just he's gonna just He's going to destroy everything, surely. Just leave him, leave him to the Tuscans. If the scales are tipped in <laughs> in favor of the Jedi, then this kid can only bring harm to the Jedi. Yeah, I, th- I think I think there's an interesting uh, thread there that the inter- their interpretation as well mm. uh, could be questioned. I mean, the, the, these dry council meetings where they're sitting around on beanbags, like <laughs> it, it could have had a bit more of an interesting thread if they're like, no, I think. Yeah. This is what he, this means. Like we need to be careful, and it could have, you know, there could have been a real conflict within the council, and it could have been, you know, rather than all just going, no, 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 you're wrong. Computer says no, and you know, a conflict within a council of beings that are supposed to be centered is quite an interesting concept. I think the Jedi being splintered by their differing opinions about this boy, yeah. I think, would be really good. I definitely believe. Sorry, not to labor the point too much here now because we need to move on, but I do believe that. In our rewrite of this movie, we need to lean into the idea that it is obvious that this boy it yeah. is obvious to everybody that this boy is bad for Jedi because we know anyway where Anakin Skywalker is going to end up. So you got to have the Jedi acknowledge that, not just, oh, he's too old. He's too mm-hmm. old. No, that's an arbitrary excuse. Um, he's the chosen one, make an exception. It's the idea that you you must know just from the way the scales are tipped right now that he's going to tip them in the other direction. Yeah, totally. And, I, I think that's nice. I think, I think it works know. well because we, we want to see the fear of, not the fear of the Jedi, but you know the, the trepidation, I guess, the, their worry, um, and also lean into the idea that they're flawed. And they're part, of, they're part of the issue, which we're going to go into number two, which is you know, the the idea of this bloated republic, you know, the Jedi are, they're not freeing slaves and they're not, you know, keeping the peace. They're just, they're just part of the system at this point. And, you know, they are, they are at the, they're, they're ordered around by the chancellor. Like he tells them what to do. You know, they're, they're part of this uh, bloated republic that is, you know, it's going to fall. We're going to see a Constantinople size collapse of this society, and we see this through the politics, the trade route, you know, blockades, the Senate speeches. Um, we see a lot of council meetings where everyone's chatting, like I say, on beanbags. And I, I, I think I get why. I can, I understand why, and I'm glad that we see this because it's. We want to see how it falls. We want to see how the republic falls. And it's through hubris and, I guess, self-obsession in a way. Um, they're more like, like as a lot of developed uh, countries begin to experience uh, when they get to a level of, I don't know, political evolution. It's gridlocked. Everything's gridlocked, and we see that here. And we see, you know, it's it's a message of what, what how things fall into um, fascist um, dictatorial. Government, governmental systems, which is what happens here. Great, I love that, but I just think we needed more action, and I don't mean political action. I mean we needed to, you know, bookend these scenes with something else happening that relates to it. How, 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 how what's your opinion on the politics and the chancellors and all this kind of stuff? Okay, I never had a problem with the politics in theory. Because I do believe that political intrigue, for example, I mean, the political thriller is, you know, I think one of the most popular movie genres out there. You know, I imagine if you were to look at the statistics on Netflix or whoever, you know, the political thrillers of that platform would probably be very high up there in the viewings, viewing ratings and stuff. People love a good political thriller because it's something that they can connect to because we're all connected to politics. We're all affected by politics. I think what we need in a movie like this is is compelling politicians. Mm. Uh, and that, that is the problem for me with the politics of this and the, the bloated republic and all that is, again, it feels like this is an interpretation. It feels like someone's just said it's bloated and we're running with that now. I don't really see that much evidence. I see arrogant politicians arguing or whatever, but I don't see the, the problems of the galaxy like... Um, 
again, that would suggest we need a chosen one to bring balance or whatever, you know, and restore order or whatever. You know, it, it does feel like things are going quite well and that your problems are often small problems. Um, mm. You know, even the, the invasion of Naboo is a very tame thing where like they're all politely gathering out in the, out in the plains, you know, <laughs> instead of like, ter- you know, we're, we're seeing what invasion looks like in the news right now. And, and it's horrific. And, um, you know, that's not what we're getting in that movie. So even when things are bad, it's not that bad, but, you know, by, by, mm. you know, by any measurable standard. And so um, I think the, I think what I would like is more compelling politicians, uh, you know, we, we see a, a more compelling political intrigue. Chancellor Valorum being voted out because of a vote of no confidence. Maybe an assassination attempt is a more interesting way mm. to do this, you know, force him to res- force him out or or um, or scandal or or something that we can just be like, ooh, that's juicy. You know, that's that's something that we can actually sink our teeth into as a as an audience. Um, I always say it doesn't really make sense that Palpatine is putting his his is betting it all on the Queen of Naboo because she is not a good speaker. I, I really like Padme as a character. I don't fully understand the Queen Amidala Padme thing. I'm being honest, if I'm being honest, uh, is the w- woman we see preaching to the? That's not Natalie Portman. I mean, she's unrecognizable with all the makeup and everything, and the the hair, and the, like I don't know what's going on. But it, sometimes it's Keira Knightley, and sometimes it's uh, Natalie Portman. I don't know. <laughs> but the, you've got this this queen who speaks in this very monotone. She's more the the Roger Roger droids have more personality than her, and I'm like. This is not the person you want crying out for a vote of no confidence. You need a passionate speaker. You need somebody who is like, who is going to rally the masses. And I don't believe that she's the one to do that. So it's not the politics that's the problem. It's the politicians are the problem for me. They're boring and they're, they're, they don't, they're not good speakers. Say what you want about Trump, but he knew how to speak to his base and that got him elected. You know, um, yeah. and not to get too. Yeah, I mean, I mean it's, uh, it, a good political there, speech a, goes viral, and the West Wing proves that, and you know, sometimes the PM questions on BBC will prove that. You need. Uh, there's no impassioned speech good enough to make us believe that Palpatine is on the like he's going home now. All right, the plan is underway. You know, like no. yeah, I think I think it's true that, that there isn't enough inspiration in in those halls like everyone's dry as anything and yes politics can be dry and it's mimicking like the the u.s senate locked in you know indecision because they're split down the middle and you know i get that but yes there needs to be some more inspiration but if you look at how many how many planets and societies are there represented that is going to be like globalization on a galactic level it's going to be chaos and it's going to be complicated and it doesn't mean everyone's just going to pull in the same direction all the time so i like the idea of a scandal or a suicide a, a um uh assassination attempt on on the the chancellor to force him out um you know could we lean even further into it the fact that is so are they beating the drum of war constantly is there a false false flag event like bombings or engineered famines or anything like that you have a cuz i think you want Palpatine to murder Valorum, right? Like, yeah. let, let's just not hide it. Like, we know who Palpatine is. You're high, you're not, you're not doing any, you're not making any attempt to hide who he really is, and even acknowledge who he is right at the very end when the camera pans over to him ominously. You know, mm. so lean into it right from the beginning. Valorum is involved in a scandal. He takes his own life out of disgrace, and then it turns out later Valorum uh, was murdered by Palpatine mm. and you know Shif- or, shifty sheave or yeah or you have him commit the murder and then later on there's a, a suicide note or something like that you know and it's yes. like I don't know I know it's <laughs> I mean when, would you ever see that in Star Wars probably not but uh, something a little bit more that leans into the Sith leans into the game you know the the the, the kind of the the unscrupulous nature of Palpatine mm. and not just reliant on one bad political speaker to rally the masses against Valorum. Yeah. It can't be yeah, that it can't be that easy, you know. I um, think leaning into that political thriller like I like structure for this would work really well. Um an extra thing I thought about the the Naboo thing because it doesn't feel like a pending invasion. 
on on the ground it's not going to be peaceful when these these people are you know the the uh, the guys are there. The trade federation are there, ready to invade. It's gonna, there's going to be arguments. It's going to be teetering on civil war because they're going to be an indecision. What what if there's splinter cells of you know angry political activists going up there and trying to bomb 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 it? Yeah, <laughs> you know yeah. they're they're trying to de- or disable them or what whatever it is. And that you know Palpatine knows this and he's like he's helping stoke secretly stoke this war yeah yeah through all of these different reasons yes those people should be allowed to defend their planet it's their own sovereign planet well i mean arguably it's the gungans but you know it's their sovereign world and these people are going to invade so why shouldn't they be able to defend themselves but they're trying to do it through political means it can be the birth of the separatist movement exactly you know you you you, you can feed into attack of the clones here we can feed into loads of other things if we sort of really take the hook of that um political uh thriller idea that you know these these um fractious groups of angry people in society are going to be pulling in all different directions and there's going to be people who are violent, people who are trying to be um, people who are going to achieve things by political means and it's chaos. And you know what? The, the solution to making it, to restructuring it as a political thriller is you just need Palpatine to, to be nefarious in the film. Again, we know who he is. Don't hide behind it. You don't have to make him sound like this nice old man or anything like that. Um, he wasn't that. He wasn't actually that old in that film. Actually, I just have this idea of Ian McDermott with the prosthetics and all that. Um, but uh, you, 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 you're you're trying to play him up as this nice person, as if as if we're not aware of where he's going to go. And and you've got to, I think, just you know, you know, Mission Impossible one, where I think is a Krieger. I think is it um, the guy who's now in the new Mission Impossible trailer. Um, he's the the CIA guy um, who meets with Tom Cruise in the in the restaurant. Yeah. And um Tom Cruise blows up the the aquarium or whatever and runs away and it's um that guy is brilliant because he's he is he's not the enemy but you don't mm-hmm. know you he's designed to be deceptively untrustworthy. You know, he's designed to be this guy who will stab you in the back to get ahead in life, but he'll never break mm-hmm. the rules. And he is a patriot at heart and all that kind of stuff, you know? And, um, and he's, he's not the bad guy, right? Yeah. He's just a thorn in Tom Cruise's side in that movie. And you could have done that with Palpatine, where if you don't want to lean into the idea he's a villain, you can just have him be, you know, like, Valorum, don't, don't twist my hand or I'll make sure the rest of the world, the rest of the galaxy knows, you know, and you know that's a lie, yeah, but they don't know that or whatever, you know, and you make him... Just that's where the political int- intrigue can start to come out is corrupt politicians. I mean, you know? we could make Valorum utterly corrupt. I yeah, mean, yeah, I know yeah, that yeah. that's that's kind of voiced in this, and that he his strength falls away when it comes to making strong decisions and that because he's got his pockets aligned or what. How, however, they're trying to perceive it. I mean, what if he's got a spice addiction or something? You know, yeah, yeah, that'd be great. Yeah, really filthy the guy up, and you know, get. You no, know, I, me- I mentioned. I mentioned that tonally. If he was to take his own life, for example, as a plot device, that would probably be out of totally uh, inappropriate for a Star Wars movie. I get that. But it is also arguable that Senate hearings and votes of no confidence and PM questions and all that kind of stuff is equally totally inappropriate for not inappropriate in a bad way, but, you know, just not great for a kid's movie you know and ewan mcgregor has recently when talking about these films he has framed them as these were made for younger audiences and 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 i totally agree with that and i totally support that i don't want to deprive you know the audiences of like the young anakin or anything like that because i think all that really helps get young audiences in and love star wars but uh yeah if we're doing that then maybe the whole senate discussions and stuff isn't there isn't probably good for the kids then you know and so if you're going to have Senate stuff and government stuff in there, go down the House of Cards route and, and, and just tone it down a little bit so it still has your PG-12s rating or whatever it is. Um, anyway, yeah, I think, that's, I think that's the way to go on that one. Yeah, I, I think as we're, as we're on the, the, the category of backstabbing, um, that segues us into number three, which is Darth Maul. Like, he, 
Why didn't we get more of him? <laughs> like, he was brilliant. He was on the front of everything. They sold a lot of toys. Double-ended lightsaber. That that blew my mind. I think I was 16 at the time. So I was kind of in a period of my life where I'm like, oh, you know, is it is it is it going to be cool? Is it, you know, is is it is it is it youthful and you know exciting? And then I saw a double-ended lightsaber. I was like, oh my god, it's amazing! And you know, that was he was a great character, amazing invention, terrifying, like vicious. We saw a Sith in the way we hadn't seen before. We what? saw a, okay. a Sith Lord's face in anger as they were fighting. I know we'd had a bit of the Emperor doing it, but not with a lightsaber in the way that, that uh, Vader had been. His face was covered. We saw the fury in this this creature's eyes. I love Maul. What about you? What, what, what do you think? Of I mean, him? obviously I love Maul, yeah. I think he he's just looks so great. In the same way, Boba Fett looks so amazing. I don't know why I like Maul so much outside of his aesthetic. Um... I, I like the dual lightsaber. I think that's very clever. Um, probably, sh- I don't think they should have overplayed it in the trailer. This is a film that didn't need any trailers to market it. And uh, they they kind of revealed it. I knew going into this film, dual lightsaber. I think they should have held off because that would have been the m- biggest mind-blowing thing for any audience going into that film. But it was all revealed in trailers and toys and stuff like that. So I don't know. There was a part of me that felt like they could have hid that a little bit more, buried that a little bit more. Um, The thing is, right, I see the value of Darth Maul for Palpatine because he is my, he's my, um, he's the guy who'll blacken his soul for me, right? I never fully understood the uh the you know um count dooku as an apprentice because it felt like he almost looks like he's older and probably chris really was older than ian mcdermott um that that palpatine is probably a better um apprentice let's say i understand that you need count dooku as your as your opposite number in this war it's chancellor palpatine versus count dooku you know in the fight for the galaxy's soul but um, as an apprentice, I never totally understood that. But I understand Maul. He is the guy mm. who can, he's the bodyguard. He's the brilliant bodyguard. Um, okay, here's the problem with Darth Maul for me is you've introduced the idea of the rule of two. I don't think that rule is necessary. I think that rule has overcom- is a bit overcomplicated and convoluted. I get it. Um, Sith always want power. And so, um, ma- but but why would you why would you want an apprentice at all then if they're just going to want your power? Like you must know that that's the thing, right? I mean, you you yourself killed your master, and so so the thing is, I believe that Maul is loyal to a to a fault, and yet the rule of two suggests to me that Maul will one day try and betray. Palpatine. So I'm wondering, should you rather than have Maul as this kind of absolutely loyal to a fault character, have him be one who is resentful of his position as apprentice? Mm-hmm. Um, and if Obi Wan is the guy who is loyal to Qui Gon, make Maul the guy who is make him a mirror for what Anakin will become in Episode Two. And I, okay. and I don't, and I don't yeah. mean complaining. I don't mean, you know, any of that. You can still re- maintain Maul as this reserved, scary kind of guy, this quiet guy who doesn't say anything. Um, but you can have him kind of just look. You can have, he's great at using his eyes in, that, mm. in you know, the way he's able to look. And like you say, those expressions of anger. And you can have something where Palpatine might say something and walk away. And then Maul might just kind of snarl a little bit, you know, and then walk away. And it's, mm-hmm. it suggests... I don't like the way I'm being treated, um, you know, and something like that might be great. Yeah. Do you, uh, yeah, he shouldn't die. He should just flee. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to kill Qui-Gon, but I haven't like, he's still alive and you can either spend your last moments with your master or you can chase me and that's it, you know? And so you can still have exactly what happens at the end of that film. It's just he runs away. Yes. Um, you know, it's the most simple rewrite, I think, of this whole list. Yeah, I, I think I think there's, there were some interesting choices made with him. The rule of two for me, 
I quite like the complexity of what that brings. It's the the fact that you the 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 rule of two was to stop the chaos, basically, and you know there was only ever going to be two. One was the master, one was the apprentice. The master would pour all of their knowledge and power into this apprentice and make them a Sith Lord, and then eventually they would kill you. And then they would take on an apprentice. The whole idea of what was going on with the rule of two is you would eventually kill your elder in like a very primal animalistic way, like the younger cub killing the the, but the head that, of the pride. Does that but make I, I, yeah. I like that because then their whole relationship's based on one of them going to kill each other at some point. But does that make sense as a rule? Like I'm just saying, it, like the midi chlorians isn't necessary. It doesn't contribute anything. It just complicates it. Um, and and the rule of two to me just complicates it because I if the idea is the quest for power, the lust for power, you don't want power to just give it away. You, it's gluttonous. It's it's you're hoarding. You're 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 wanting it all for yourself. You know and the idea then that you would have an ally. I understand why Palpatine would want Maul by his side because I can't do the fighting because I'm not the fighter. I'm the brains. You're the brawn. I get that. Um, but the idea of a rule of two in general is is underexplored in this movie. Is there any point where an apprent where an apprentice Sith apprentice in this trilogy tries to have a go at taking the power from Palpatine? No. We we may get glimpses of it in uh in Clone Wars maybe I think, but at no you know there's only those moments to join me you know and we can, but. Yeah, I mean, but he's encouraging it in Jedi, right? He's like, strike, strike me down. He's 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 asking for it to happen. It's almost like he's committing to the evolution of the rule of two. He's yeah, he's yeah. he's he's asking us to kill him so they can they can continue I, I ruling think... the galaxy as two. Like it's there's there's an interesting thing for me in that. I like the there's a it's not a duality really, is it? There's just a I don't know. There's a there's 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 a, a complication in a relationship that I kind of like. Yeah, yeah, no, no. I but I yeah. just I just think the rule of two was made so for one purpose, and that was you know as in the way Lucas wrote it. I think it was written for one purpose, and that was so that when Samuel L. Jackson is saying, you know, the thr- like at the very end during the funeral, he says, um, he says, you know, we need to uncover the mystery of who this phantom menace was i don't think he says that word but um and then uh you know if the sith have returned we need to be careful here right and then yoda says something along the lines of always two there are master and apprentice no more no less okay then so which one was he the master or the apprentice and then we pan over to palpatine and it's a wonder it is a great i love that that ending i think that 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 section i think that's really great but the idea it, it feels like the whole rule of two was only written so that we can pan over to Palpatine and, and, and show the audience the threat is far from over. Which we know the threat is far yeah. from over. We know this isn't the end. You've just found Darth Vader in a desert planet. The threat is far from over. So you don't need to be telling me or signposting or signaling that... There's another person out there ready. Like, we know. Um, so I don't, I don't see the value. And I think you can cut out the rule of two altogether from this entire universe, and it will never affect any scene in any movie going forward. So I, th- I, th- you know? I, I guess what we're saying, we need, we need more of a relationship with Maul. Yeah, and, yeah. Cut, and, out, cut out the uh, idea of... Yeah, cut out the idea of a, of a master and apprentice and all that, and just have it be a case where it's... I'm the bodyguard or something, you know, and like, and I'm being bossed around and I don't like it. Or, you know what, one day I would aspire to be like him and, 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 you know, and it can be the different, it can, it can foreshadow the, the, the greed that nice. Vader might have. I don't know. Yeah. I mean, he needs, he needs more agency, right? I mean, he's got four lines. Yeah. And it was, uh, it was Peter Serafinowicz that voiced him. Uh, so yeah, he, he, vo- he, he had his voice dubbed over. It wasn't Ray Park that did it. And then weirdly, uh, he was in space with Simon Pegg. He was a side character. And there was a whole story about Simon Pegg hating the Phantom Menace because he worked in a comic book shop. And he also hates Peter Serafinovic, Peter Wicks' character. And he he quotes Darth Maul in this thing. Like, there's this weird whole <laughs> circle that goes on. But I loved his voice. I thought he was great in it. He needed, he needed more lines, needed more agency. Maul is the guy who he... 
Maul should have come, yeah, Maul should have returned in the industry. I do think it's Lucas didn't know what he had created. And I don't mean that in a bad way. I just mean, you know, sometimes you just don't know that you're onto something or you just don't know how audience are going to react to it. I think he just felt he was probably creating a, a once off, um, uh, just, you know, one and done kind of character and the love affair we had. But then also if, if, if these prequels are, the ex- are an experiment to grow different threads and branches on a, on an ever growing tree, then he's done his job correct on this one, you know? So, so I guess, I guess keep him, keep him alive. And definitely I'm, keep not him saying alive. We, yeah. I'm not saying we replace general grievous, but the idea of the wheezing general who's been hobbled by a Jedi could have been played by him. Um, you know, what I mean, there, there is there is space for him. Um, so I think, I think we, you know, we want more, more basically. Um, then, if we move on to point four, it's other characters that, are not necessarily underserviced, but they're a lot of them are be, being put in an area of comic relief, or there's a childish tone to their nature. So the Gungans, um, the droids, uh, a lot of the creatures and characters in. Um, on Tatooine, so like Watto, the the podcast announcer, they're, they're all a little bit silly, right? And and Anakin also falls into that category. So I, I I think if we just try try and focus on two two of them broadly for now, so like Jar Jar, Jar Binks and um, Anakin, which are two of the the, the most stated, um, you know, I guess. <laughs> Uh, points of activation, um, you know, trigger triggers for people with this film. I mean, first there's Jar Jar Binks. So he was a curious choice to have as a, a guide in this film. What, what do you make of him? Okay. I am going to defend Jar Jar Binks because I believe that I remember being in the cinema when I was 12 watching this film. And I remember chuckling at some of Jar Jar Binks' moments. And I remember my sister, who was probably, I don't know, maybe six or seven at the time, laughing at some of Jar Jar Binks' moments. And I remember my cousin, who was probably even younger, having a Jar Jar Binks teddy bear. (laughs) Kids love that guy. And I remember teaching a class, teaching a lecture a few years back, and I made a reference to Phantom Menace or something like that. And there was a 19, 20, 21-year-old person in the class who made a very uh, very good Jar Jar Binks impression. And it was out of true love for that character. People do like that character, but they get drowned out by the uh, the hate that's out there for them. Uh, Ahmed Best never gets enough credit for the role that he has played in the the uh, the mocap evolutions, the uh, mocap yeah. acting. We always talk about Andy Circus. It's Andy Circus standing on the shoulders of Ahmed Best. Mm. No disrespect to Andy Serkis, right? Um, Phantom Menace changed the game for how films get get made. And there is there is a place for that character, I believe. Not only because of the role of, of, of the joy that it has brought to kids, but the role that it has played in changing the film industry moving forward, okay? And mm. I would hate to remove that character, but I do... My, my only thing that I would suggest is you've got to give the character more functionality. Right mm-hmm. now, you know, you described him as a, as a character who is a guide. He's not a guide, really, let's be honest. He, he barely functions as a guide. I mean, that's, you know, you're doing him, uh, a, you're, you're being generous there. Well, I guess, I guess, I guess guide, if, you, you know? if you have to clutch, clutch for straws to give him yeah, a role yeah, in the film, yeah, yeah, yeah. You it might yeah. be there. I mean, obviously his role is also comic relief. And to sell some toys. He is nothing but baggage to our characters in this film. C-3PO and R2-D2 are baggage to our heroes in the original trilogy, but they play valuable roles in busting them out of jails or or um, giving them the odds of survival, which they're usually right. You know, C-3PO is usually right about everything. C-3PO will say, but you can't go in there or whatever. And then it's like, no, nah, shut them up. And then suddenly... Uh, you know, you're like, oh, actually, we probably should listen to 3PO. You know, he's mm. he's always right. He's just annoyingly always right, you know. And yep. Jar Jar Binks is a character who is made a general in this war for the fight for the fight for Naboo out of great, out of out of really just generosity because everybody's really happy and bubbly after their alliance at the end, you know, in the third act. 
This is gross negligence, if you ask gross me. Gross negligence, absolutely, <laughs> right? Um, there should be a court martial for someone. <laughs> yeah, I mean that is real gross negligence. But you know what I would have done? I would have made him like a, a le- I know it sounds so left field because we 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 have this ingrained idea of uh, this idea of who Jar Jar is ingrained in our mind. Rewrite the character as somebody who is like a fallen warrior, you know, mm-hmm. some guy who 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 you know used to be uh, uh you know used to be a, a you know a, a a kind of a revered warrior who lost his way and has just become zen has just become you know all is you know i don't want to kill anymore life is good you know look how beautiful that tree is just be so zen like this 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 kind of um this this warrior that's finally at peace with everything and just doesn't want anything to do with war and is now suddenly thrown back into a war and at the very end it's like Will you accept, will you, will you come back and be, you know, uh, a general again, if you have to have that, you know, I don't know, but just give him some. I, I love, I love, I love that idea of like a, a warrior who's put their sword down, you know, like we've seen it so many times. I mean, I love Eastwood in Unforgiven, like it's just masterful. Like that whole story is building up to him picking up his guns and having a shot of whiskey again so he can kill some people. Like, I, I, I like that You know what I, would, uh, what I would have is I would have him exactly as you see him, this crazy kind of, you know, thing, this, uh, you know, this, this crazy creature that you just can't kind of make head nor tail of. And, and he's just baggage. And Obi-Wan is just looking at him going, oh, my God, what, you know, do, I, do we really have to have this guy come along? And then you have some, some you know, droid soldier comes out of the woods, go, you know, put him up. And then Jar Jar just goes to town on him and rips his head off or something, and you're like, "Yeah, he'll be useful," you know. And then, yeah, and then, I like I like know, that. I, th- I think th- yeah, there's a there's a comparison for him and Yoda there in Empire. Yeah. So Luke leaves Hoth for Dagobah and finds this weird little thing that is just silly, and there's a load of comic relief, but immediately when there needs to be. He's got an immense amount of knowledge and dignity, and I, I, th- I guess dignity is the word. Like these, these characters don't have any. Like Jar Jar Binks and Boss Nass. I mean, it may maybe a little bit of Boss Nass. The droids. There's no dignity for these guys. They're just silly. Like they don't necessarily have. Again, the word I'm going to use is agency. Like if if Jar Jar Binks did have a past where he was a warrior, or I mean, maybe. Have him, you know, you know what you do? You have him be, uh, when they go to this, when they go and meet uh, Anakin and Shmi and they're hearing about slaves, you have, you know, Jar Jar talk about, you, you say, I know what it's like to be a slave. And you have him lower his jacket and he's just covered in lash marks and scars. Yeah. And it's, he's got a tattoo on his wrist. Yeah. And it's like, yeah. I use, yeah. Uh, like he and he, but he's but he's he's found a way to overcome that trauma, or or maybe he's burying that trauma. He's in denial about who he is, and it, and what has come out is this is this childlike character, this clumsy kind of, um, mm. you know, it's not clumsiness because he doesn't, he you know, he, he doesn't know how to walk properly or anything like that or anything. It's 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 clumsiness because he is he is. Um, there's almost like a he's triggered so often maybe or mm-hmm. something I don't know like you can you can hint at there is a darkness again if you're mentioning slaves and if you're mentioning things like that you've got to there is a darkness to this world to this galaxy and, yeah you know I mean it would put much more weight of him returning um, to the city the Gungan city yeah. he would I know there's weight anyway he's banned for life and if he goes back he's going to get imprisoned or put to death or whatever it is but if he was imprisoned there already and is escaped and there are you know emotional and physical scars from him doing that it puts a whole different weight on him he wasn't just this happy go lucky guy they kicked out he was enslaved and tortured and then he he escaped i i realize we're going quite dark with no, no, but, no but it doesn't <laughs> but look the reality is that all of these things are heavily implied in Star Wars stuff. They're just not done in Phantom Menace. I mean, think about what happens to Shmi Skywalker in Attack of the Clones. Mm-hmm. When he goes and finds, and he kills everybody there, you know? And he says, I killed the young people, everything. 
And then in Revenge of Sith, he lights up a lightsaber and the kid just backtracks. And that has become a key part of um, Obi-Wan Kenobi now, the series. Mm. Like, dark stuff happens in these movies. It's okay. Uh, They just don't do... They're not consistent with that stuff in Phantom Menace. And Jar Jar could have been... You know, you look at him on first glance. He's He's a clumsy, silly character. But actually... There's a, there's just an, it's almost like that whole, all, you could just frame it as his whole life is an attempt to just not be the, the, the instinctive warrior that he yeah. used to be or something. One, one point I, I mentioned, um, Obi Wan, I don't like the way Obi Wan talks about, uh, um, he describes Jar Jar Binks as an inferior life form, right? Am I right? Yeah. And it's not, yeah. it's not appropriate really for many reasons, but also you're a Jedi, you shouldn't be looking at, the world in such silly ways and and there's an arrogance yeah, yeah. to and, and qui-gon does it he says oh because you can speak it doesn't make you an intelligent life form like the, it, it kind the of jedi does, it, kind of yeah kind of does, the jedi yeah. kind of dicks right yeah, yeah, like, yeah totally but also <laughs> you you mentioned a comparison to yoda um yoda yeah. surely they should be wiser and and, and more um accepting of people who don't mm. look like them and don't talk like them you know, and it does again. It does feel like didn't really kind of fully understand what it is we're mm. writing. You know, so anyway, yeah, yeah. So I, I, th- I think uh, for for a lot of the characters with a comic slant in, we we need to have at least a hint of dignity, a hint of a more serious life at one point, or then returning to. Uh, the nature of war because that's what's happening on the planet and it's it's something that and if you, and if you want if you, don't be surprised if we hate the character when our heroes hate the character yeah that's, exactly you know, i'm sorry but you've got you know yeah. you big them up say you know show it t- have our characters tell us that have obi-wan and qui-gon tell us you know uh rather than saying just because you can talk doesn't mean you're intelligent have them say something like just because you're clumsy doesn't mean you're not smart. Yeah. You know, and, and, yeah. and, and there you now, ah, okay. I'll keep my eye open for him, you know? Um, so I love Jar Jar is a tragic story because the car, even the characters don't believe in him and it's hard for, to ask an audience to believe in him. You know, I don't think the audiences are being cruel when they say, I don't like Jar Jar Binks. I so think, that that guy needs know. redemption. He needs a redemption story. Are you, you are aware of the the how how Jar Jar meets his end, right? How I don't uh, know. So uh, spoilers for uh, some of the books, I think. But uh, in one of the books, a character is walking down the street and sees a busker, and it's uh, and he's Jar Jar Binks, and he's you know it's implied he's homeless and poor and. Um, you know, the, the, the world has not, the universe has not been kind to him in the fall of the empire. And the idea is that because he was a very sycophantic character who was just always bigging up everybody he thought was a friend, he was too trusting for his own good. Mm. And he just trusted every, he believed everybody. He was such a nice character that he believed everybody had good in them, even Emperor Palpatine. And at the, after the empire fell, um, Jar Jar just couldn't catch a break because everybody associated him with being one of Palpatine's sycophants. Okay, and, yeah, and it is yeah. uh, it's and he's he's a busker uh, left to his um, you know, left you know, that's his only way of making any sort of yeah. uh, living, and it's it's a quite a uh, one man band kind of thing, and it's it's just a fall from where he was, you know, um, and uh, I'm sure some people were happy to see that happen. Yeah, <laughs> like yes, finally. <laughs> bad, bad. Yeah. On a plus side, though, Ahmed Best has been brought back into the Lucasfilm family. Uh, he's doing, I think, some kids stuff, some some young, oh, yeah? some children's uh, Star Wars content now. I think. Oh, nice. Um, yeah, there's two or three, two or three uh, things coming out on Disney Plus, yeah, isn't yeah, there? I think he's Star Wars focused things. Talk, yeah. Talking about children in Star Wars. Anakin. Uh, let's let's move on to the the big, the pre pre big bad, which is Anakin Skywalker, um, Jake Lloyd. I people didn't didn't really like his portrayal i think it did quite well with what he had in this i i i I think there was an unusual thing they did with his age and the way they approached his nature Mm. um particularly after the the launch poster 
that one that blew everyone's minds of the little boy in the shadow of Vader, which was and concept was, art. That wasn't Lucasfilm, I believe. I think that was. Oh, really? I think that was somebody had created that, and Lucasfilm acquired it. I believe. I might be however wrong. That, I might be wrong. That was that. Created, it was. Yeah. It was smart. So that that was great. And then we got into the film, and there was a lot of yippies and I'm ha- I'm a happy little boy kind of thing which is not what people expected what how how did you feel when we first met him <laughs> the thing well, is your- the thing is I don't know what people were expecting because he's hardly going to be the guy that we see. you know if you're going to do the I kid a tiny years- little helmet <laughs> <laughs> it does feel like that he uh the, I think audiences were you know, when I look at Phantom Menace, I don't see Vader. Like, obviously, I don't see Vader, but I don't see anything related to Anakin or Vader. I see a child who is our vehicle into the inner workings, uh, machinations of this galaxy and the people who populate it. I don't mm-hmm. see the the boy. Who, I'm not looking for the clues. When I'm watching Obi Wan Kenobi right now, I'm looking at Ewan McGregor and I'm watching. I'm listening to his, the timbre of his voice and stuff, and I'm thinking, yeah, I can hear Alec Guinness a little bit there, and I can see Alec Guinness a little bit there, and I'm looking for those joining of the dots. And when I, you know, if if uh, you know, and I'm I, I I do that a lot with some of those kind of puzzle pieces in Star Wars, but with Phantom Menace, I'm not at all looking at um, Anakin as a, as any heir to a throne you know i'm looking at him as just he's just a young character uh, who's going to be a reason for us to go to coruscant and yes and and he's the he's the the home alone kid who's going to sabotage the trade federation you know later on you know that's i think that i just see it as that you know if this is yeah. this is the ultimate star wars kids movie and you've got to have a kid at the center of it so that's how i look at it um i think the bigger question is did we need to see anakin so young i wonder would it have been better to see him maybe 12 13 14 you know where you know um the 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 growth of a child from 12 to 14 is serious. I mean, it's, you know, there's a serious yeah. change in personality there along the way. And, and I think maybe, uh, an Anakin, you know, at that, you know, kind of, uh, mid teens kind of age mm. <laughs> may have been worse. I don't know, but it, 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 it could have been, he could have been more difficult as well, you know, and so on. And I uh, think so. Yeah. I mean, I think, what they did some, I don't know, you know, what they did in Attack of the Clones with the the whiny complaining, let's call it, was that was the attempt of the foreshadowing of his his temper, right? But why not just use temper? I understand that in in Attack of the Clones he's being trained to suppress that part of himself because he started training too late. But yeah, why not have a fourteen year old, thirteen year old kid who okay. has has shown force sensitivity rather than just a test? He's PTSD damaged because he's a slave, and maybe he's hobbled. Maybe he's got something missing. Like that would be a total foreshadowing of becoming yeah, Vader. Yeah, yeah. Maybe he's got a finger missing or a hand or something, he's and it, you know he's got a prosthesis. Like okay, he uh, he's a slave. He was injured in a as child labor um, victims of child labor. You know, often do they get injured? Um, so he's not good for anything, but he can pod race. How do you pod mm-hmm. race with one hand? You'd have a robotic hand. No, but he uses his mind. He, or, a, he's or, a, or a hook. He's force, sens- <laughs> he's force sensitive. And so yes. he's, you know, and, and what else can you do with the force? Well, you know, like, and you can have him with a prosthetic and it can be a robotic prosthetic. I mean, he built C-3PO. He can build himself a prosthetic. I don't know. Um, yeah. You know, and so have him... Yeah, have him be some sort of like an angry kid. I was, I was going to suggest you make him Drew Barrymore in Firestarter in episode one. You make him Carrie uh, in, in episode two. And by episode three, he's Vader. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and, and you just do the, um, the, the, the kind of the, the Stephen King approach to writing, uh, you know, these kind of troubled characters, you know, these troubled young characters. Um, Look, I, I, yeah, he needs, I, I still think, I still, not to pat myself on the back, I'm quite proud of the, uh, him cheating with, to win loads of pod races and Watto's I mean, just that, rolling that, in it. I love that. So, I think that's great. So the, um, the, the idea of him cheating in the pod races, what if he, he rams another competitor off the track 
in in Beggar's Canyon, so no one can see it. He kills him, and then doesn't it uh, conceals it? It just says, "Yeah, that guy was well out of control. He couldn't. He could, you know, quite yeah. done go. Oh my yeah, god, you were yeah. lucky being so close to that accident." Yeah. It's like, yeah, that guy, you know. He obviously needed more practice, so you know. It's, God rest his his podcast race, his, his pod racing soul. You've got um, to, you've got to have. Yeah, you. It is it is amazing. Like as I said, I don't look at him as anything close to the Anakin yeah. that we're getting in episode two. When I see Anakin in episode two, for better or worse, I do see a trajectory mm. towards Vader. Um, yeah. I don't see any kind of eyebrow raising suspicions or anything here in episode one. And I think there's way, uh, there's so much opportunity for Obi-Wan of all people to be like, you know, Mm. um, you know, and yeah, I love that idea of him. He rams a guy off. He lies about what happened and it's Obi-Wan then goes to the crash Mm. site, you know, and it could be, you know what, actually that pod has some of the parts we need go to the crash site, you know, or it could be Obi-Wan just not trusting Qui-Gon and Qui-Gon's like, I need you to fall in line here. And he's like, well, Yoda doesn't, Yoda doesn't trust this kid. Why, you know, why, why are you, why are you trusting him? I don't know. I feel like that needs to be something to build towards. Also, you need a reason why Mace Windu is going to be so against. Mace Windu really doesn't like Hayden, or sorry, uh, Anakin in Revenge of the Sith. There's a real dislike there. And in episode two, I think maybe there's evidence as well he doesn't. You've got to build that in. Like, give us a reason why these people, because otherwise you're just, you're kind of, it's just there for the sake of it. It's almost like they can just predict the future at that point, which they kind of can. Yeah. You know. So I, th- I, th- I think if we're leaning into the idea that he, he appears to do many things that make him the prophesized run rather than just his his ability like this a number of things that happen where he is undeniably the chosen one so therefore if there is rumors of him doing something nefarious it's not like they can just kick him out they can't just go no kick him out he's the entire structure of their theology mm, yeah coming to life so they have to somehow try and deal with that maybe they can seal it because it's like oh my god he he did ram that guy off maybe he didn't mean to kill him maybe he was just trying to win it was was it a mistake or a misstep? Maybe they're questioning his motivations, and you know, even the audience probably don't know what's going. Well, obviously, we know in the the, the wider picture. I'm going to do my um, my uh, what has become known as my famous third act pitch at the end of these <laughs> give episodes. It, give right? it me, John. Tell okay. me, tell me, am I crazy with this? But anyway, they're on the starship. It's just been you know they've just managed to escape Naboo and all that, and they're trying to figure out where do we go next, and. He's, and Qui-Gon says, Tatooine, I have a friend there who can help. And they go there and they're looking for this friend of Qui-Gon's and Shmi Skywalker shows up. And she's somebody who has been a good friend to Qui-Gon over the years. And they go mm-hmm. back to the, the house for supper or whatever. And Obi-Wan's like, Master, how do you know this woman? And then Anakin emerges and she says, Anakin, you remember uh, uh, Master Qui-Gon? Uh, you know, and wow, wow, Anakin, you've grown, you know, so much. And you, and what you realize is, and Obi Wan's like red flags going everywhere for Obi Wan. Yeah, and you realize that Qui Gon has secretly been, he uh, he came across this this woman and this child at one point. He helped them maybe, or she saved his life or something. And he has been every now and again going back to just keep tabs on on Anakin because there's something about him he just can't shake. And rather than it being this total coincidence that you just happen to walk in right into the, it's, it's, I, I'm using this as an opportunity to come again. This time we need help, but it's a chance to check in on the boy. Now the boy is ready and I'm going to present him to the thing. And then what you do is when they're at the council, you have Mace Windu say, we've been through this Qui-Gon. You are lucky you got, you, you weren't expelled from the Jedi order last time. All right. Mm -hmm. And then you realize that's why he's not on the Jedi Council, because there's something about his affiliation with the Skywalkers. That's a problem for the Jedi. And Obi-Wan is just red flags going up. What are you not telling me? And the audience is thinking, is he Anakin's father? Yeah. But you never say it. You never say it. And in episode two, it's Anakin wants to know who his father is. 
I'm going to go. I want to talk to my mother. You're not talking to your mother. You left that life behind, Anakin. You need to fall in line. I want to talk to my mother. When he finally goes and talks to his mother, it's too late. And by the time he gets to, you get to Revenge of the Sith, it's Obi-Wan, you cost me everything. You're the reason I couldn't see my mother Mm. because you were trying to protect me from some truth. You wouldn't tell me who my father, I have nothing because of you. And even Padme doesn't want anything to do with me. And it's a lie that has been planted Anakin's whole life has been a lie. Just like Luke's whole life has been a lie. Just like yeah, nice. Just, I like it. Like Ray's whole life has been a lie. The one thing that is missing from this trilogy is there is no question about lineage because it's a virgin birth. There's always been a question of lineage. Ray, for better or worse, it's consistent to the narrative. And yep. Luke's, obviously. And Obi-Wan lies to Luke. And you can have Obi-Wan lie to Anakin about the truth. And, and you can let the audience decide whether they like the idea that you don't have to say anything. We never said that Qui-Gon is his father. You, impl- you, you inferred that. But it can just be a case where I never met my father, but Qui-Gon was like a father figure to me growing up. And he taught me. Yeah, I, 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 nur- I, I, th- nurtured, I think there's something. Nurtured, yeah. You know? Anyway, go on. Yeah. There's something very interesting in, in the Qui-Gon uh, potential uh, potentially having a, a child outside, you know, uh, I, I think if you do imply that, you need to at least do a hint of paying it off. Yeah, yeah, you would. Have. You know, it doesn't need to be said to Anakin. It doesn't need to be revealed. Maybe he never finds out, but the audience need to have a really solid idea of it because the the whole raise. Uh, lineage thing was that was not well received i don't think the way that they did it because they went back and forth obviously the the film changed hands a num- the films uh, changed hands directorially and i think the, the the writing teams changed around as well and they went in different directions with each film so that lineage didn't really pay off i mean if if you did want to go down the qui-gon is potentially his father route we never have to say it. We never have to see it. We never have to do anything more than it be a presumption. But there's just one moment, the fleet, one fleeting moment between him and Shimmy, like just, just one. Do they touch hands? One yeah, time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You just it's it's any, yeah. one little yeah, yeah. thing to show that they had a physical relationship at one point, and that's all you need. That's why Qui Gon is lucky to still be called a Jedi. And, yeah. and, and, and think about um, Qui-Gon's apprentice, or sorry, Qui-Gon's master was Count Dooku, you know, wasn't it? Uh, and, and so, like, there is this, if I'm not mistaken, I think Qui-Gon, yeah, yeah. Count Dooku trained Qui-Gon. So you've got this lineage in Qui-Gon's life of, you know, uh, <laughs> do, do, dodging Jedi, let's say, running, uh, teaching him bad, he's been taught bad habits. He's passed on bad habits to Anakin. And then, or sorry, to, yeah, to Anakin. And what you could almost have is, you could almost have Anakin say in episode two, you could say, I miss Qui-Gon. Mm. And you could, in an argument, they could, he could be like, I miss, I miss Qui-Gon. And Anakin is like, or Obi-Wan is like, I miss Qui-Gon too. They're bro- they, are bro- they are brothers in that respect then, you know? I like this more and more. Like the, the, the whole, uh, Obi-Wan does not want to train the boy he doesn't want him trained he agrees with windu he agrees with yoda this isn't going to work and he trains him and goes against his own ideals because it was qui-gon's wish as he died and they don't really go into it but i think there's you know you know they they talk about a life debt with the gungans it's kind of feels like that kind of pattern so why would it not be that on his deathbed he confesses he is his son only to obi-wan and says you can't tell anyone this you need to look after my son. And that is it. Instead of him saying, train the boy, you say, train my boy. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> train I, my little boy. I am the king of cheesy dialogue, aren't I? Uh. <laughs> but I like that. I mean, I, I think it would be a controversial, it would be controversial to have s- someone, well, to, to go back and now and write it in that way after Qui-Gon is who he is, I think it's controversial. But I think off the, straight out of the gates to have it that way would have probably been received differently. And I, I quite like that. Lucasfilm, if you're listening, if you ever have some idea of retconning or anything like that, you can have this one for free. <laughs> so I think 
I think while we're talking about retconning people, uh, the la- the last uh, point, um, which I think we've covered a little bit here, is the agency again uh, and the the sort of motivations of the, a lot of the characters in this because Palpatine's motivations are clear, but they're quite political at this point, which makes them a little bit flat. Everyone else is kind of just going through the motions. There isn't any big uh, arc changing sort of like decisions they make. It just kind of happens to them. And there doesn't seem to be a protagonist. It could be Qui-Gon. It could be Obi-Wan. Like, where, how do you feel about the motivations of these guys throughout? Yeah, Obi-Wan feels... <sighs> It it does it feels like an episode of television where we're putting pe- pieces together so we can get the series moving, and um, it does feel like Obi Wan should be at the center of this, and it's Obi Wan's resistance towards Anakin, his then taking Anakin on board, and being in a dilemma of sorts like following what my master taught me, following what Yoda wants me to do, and so on. Um, I think, yeah, I I would put the emphasis on Obi-Wan as a student following, struggling to follow his master and growing, learning, making mistakes and learning. And I think that alone re-centers the the overall structure, I think. Um, And yeah uh i mean it is clear it is clear if you, if you look at again the joseph campbell kind of effect on this he's he's the one that's going through an arc but there are huge parts of this story where he's not present yeah yeah he's, yeah. he's sitting on the, the ship complaining or whatever and you know there isn't there isn't enough direction for him you know revenge of the sith is arguably a dual protagonist story there's equal weight given to both Obi-Wan and Anakin, uh, and it all culminates in a great showdown. The protagonist of episode two is, is, is more centered. I mean, I would say Anakin is the protagonist of episode two. Yeah, um, yeah agreed. You know, uh, Obi-Wan is definitely present, but Anakin is definitely the one on the journey. I think episode one needs to be Obi-Wan is the protagonist and other people are just on the journey for the ride. Um, and then you've got that. We've got a movie about Obi Wan. We've got a movie about Anakin. We've got a, a dual protagonist third act. Then, um, yeah. And it's that great Star Wars duality mm. that you know there are. So, so you know, Padme and Amidala and Palpatine and the Emperor uh, and um, yeah, in the Emperor. And it's just throughout there are all these dualities. And I think to have the dual. Uh, you know, journey does work really well. So, so it's almost like it wouldn't even be that much of a change because Obi Wan does have an arc and he does develop into he does become the Jedi Master and he does take on the Padawan and he is giving Qui Gon his dying wish and it's okay. This all happened, but give me it's not consistent. Give me a a movie that you would liken. Obi Wan's. If we were to just map out an, a, a journey for Obi Wan in this movie that was similar to a, to some other movie out there, I don't know, like Rocky, just as the first thing that comes to mind. Like, I mean, I don't think Rocky is an appropriate ex- comparison, but what movie are we thinking about here? Like, is it is it like I could even imagine, you know, a character like Furiosa and Mad Max Fury Road where you know breaking free from something and going out on the on the road and making an ally along the way not in that structure of that film but just that idea of breaking free from something and trying to start new trying to start afresh uh i don't know i mean i i I do think that there's probably like a great blueprint out there for obi-wan's journey that we're not it's you know it's it's the person finding themselves within and another thing, I mean, uh, other other Lucas um, uh, properties like Indiana Jones and things like that, we do get a real development of character, but they still, you know, Indy still remains himself, 
by the end of the film, but there's more to him. He's gone through another life changing event. You know, if you look at um, the the end of um, Raiders, which leads it obviously chronologically leads into um, Last Crusade rather than uh, Temple of Doom. The the person he is at the start of Last Crusade, he's still he's still indie. He experienced yeah. <laughs> A telephone to the to God, and everyone got melted, and he's still indie. And then, you know, Crystal School is a different thing, but in that he's still indie after experiencing the Holy Grail and the healing water of God, you know, the water of life, and he's still indie. But there's more of him. So I, I think the sort of really true blue classic, you know, arc of you know there's a, there's a problem in front of them they lose faith uh, it looks like all is lost you know that kind of standard arc will fit really well into this because he's being pulled in a load of different okay. directions all right i've got it if if anakin is a student of qui-gon and even mm-hmm. if anakin only knew qui-gon for a brief moment in the in the actual film uh you do feel like he's taken on some of qui-gon's traits by the time you get into episode 2 you know he is rebellious, and he's he's not always in agreement with the Jedi Council and all that kind of stuff. Um, and he's kind of almost, in a way, by the time you get to Episode Three, he's kind of Qui Gon reincarnated in in some ways. Yeah. The way he talks to them, at, yeah, the way he talks to them <laughs> at the Council, he's like, "What? Like you must see that this is blah blah blah." You know, and Obi Wan is like, "Learn your place." You know, um, I think having Obi Wan. As it, I don't know, I can't, I've seen this somewhere in a movie. I can't remember what the movie is or the TV show is. But you take the, it's like the, um, the person who studied their whole life, followed all the books, has all the rules, has all the teachings of a certain craft, and then gets paired with the person who threw out all the rule books. You know, maybe House is an example of that. House MD, the TV series yeah. where you, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah, it's yeah, like, totally. but, but doctor, shouldn't we be, oh, you're one of those people who follows the rules, aren't you? You know, and you, you. I imagine Obi-Wan being this guy who is, no, but the rule number three, four, five of the Jedi Order says that you can't do that. Yeah, but Obi-Wan, sometimes you have to throw out the rule book. And by the time you get to the end of that movie, it's he's learned a lesson. He's learned to break one or two rules. And he's, he's you know, he's finding, his, he's finding his, his, his middle ground. But the responsibility of now being landed with Anakin means he's got to go back to the hardcore rule following yeah. again in episode two, which is what he is, um, because he needs to make sure he sets a good example. Like, I imagine, like, I don't have kids, but uh, I imagine parenting is like that, where you have to, even if you know the rules don't always apply, you have to pretend they do sometimes just to raise good kids, right? Oh, God. I mean, like, yeah. just, I've, I've got two, and, you know, even dinner times, like, are you in... You know, negotiation for yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> what time it is, what room we're going to eat it in, how what it's going to be. It's like, oh my god, but yes, but even if there, even, is, there, even, is, even, there is a level, even if you that. don't like the broccoli, you have to pretend you do for them to eat the broccoli. <laughs> I'm imagining, you know, so it's it's you kind of feel like in episode one, he he um, he's learning maybe, maybe Obi Wan's trajectory is act one, he's like, I can't believe I was paired with you you know um, i know they've been together for years before that but it's you almost feel like that's kind of what it was like and then by the time you get to the end of episode one it's you know you're getting the hang of this there's there's the jedi council jedi and then there's the real jedi out in the out in the road and you're getting the hang of it obi-wan but he's got it yeah well who 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 he thought who he thought qui-gon was um who was this stoic rule following guy on the on the face of it, he finds out he's in conflict with the uh, the council, and they kicked him off one time. He's got an illegitimate child out on Tatooine, and he's hiding him and wants to make him the the cho- because he thinks he's the chosen one of the prophecy. And then he he leaves that with Obi Wan to like deal with. <laughs> yeah, like that's yeah. a great. That's yeah, a yeah, great yeah, arc. yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so I th- let, let, let's recap what we've what we've just discussed. So, number one was the mysticism. So we think make it mystic, not scientific. Get rid of the midichlorians. Um, have a bit more about the theology and the prophecy, and understand why 
it's important and understand why the Anakin is linked to it so directly. And have, so, and have the council lean into the idea that bringing balance to the force is bad for Jedi because we know that as audiences. You know? mm, because yeah. if things are good right now, and this is the age of the Jedi, then balance to the force means, res- means changing that. So you must, if you're that wise, you must know this as well. You know. So there is, there is a, a rift. There's, there, there, there is uh, indecision um, within the council surrounding the prophecy. There's still an abstract mysticism, but they've they've made a theology of it. They've made it into a thing to to interpret it, the same as mankind's done with religion for ten thousand years. So that one, that one, I think we've got. So. The politics is a bit of a snore fest, too many embargoes and trade routes and speeches and stuff like that. We want to spice this up a bit, have a scandal, blackmail, uh, corrupt uh, senators. You know, is there, are there splinter cells of, you know, uh, Naboo rebels bombing the the trade route to, you know, and they're stoking war unavoidably? When, it, when it's dark, it's House of Cards. When it's yeah. uh, impassioned, inspirational speeches from Amidala, it's the West Wing. Yeah, you know, nailed it. Yeah. So we, we're going to have a political thriller like structure to that part of it, um, and that that would work a lot better. There'd be less snoozing. Um, we want more Darth Maul. We want his relationship to be clearer with um, uh, with Palpatine. There's going to be more scenes with them. He might be disillusioned um, with his relationship. He might want to take the throne at some point. He might just be... No, no, we said he didn't want to take the throne. He wants to be an attack dog, and he's truly um, loyal, but he's disappointed with not being in charge. Is that where we got to with it? I just feel... Uh... Yeah, I, I think if we're going to go down the rule of two, then yeah, have him ultimately want the power, I guess. Um, but just just show that he is, there is some dimension to the rule of two. Okay. Because I do, li- right. I do like that ending, you know, of, uh, always, you know, who's the, who did we kill, the master or the apprentice? You know, I like that. So I would suggest uh, just have the regular apprentice wanting to take control. But just, right, yeah. And I would yeah, totally. I would put too many more scenes, but I would just use those scenes a little bit better to have a, um, you know, so for example, when Anakin and Qui-Gon all them escape on Tatooine and Maul is left by himself, uh, you know, uh, Palpatine can get on the hologram to him and scold him and he can just snarl a yes. little bit or something, you know, a little bit, okay, a little yeah. bit more to those scenes. I don't want him talking too much either because I think there is value in his um, kind of a, mm-hmm. the kind of the mystery of him as well. So we want more, more of the dynamic with the rule of two that he's going to take over. He's pissed off. He's not in charge and he doesn't die. He might get hobbled at the end and he, he carries on into the, the attack of the clones. Um, then the childish nature of characters like Jar Jar Binks, we would again, muddy that up a bit with uh, a little bit of conflict a past where maybe they were a warrior and they've put their swords down um you know the 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 understanding of who they are and why they've done it is then put into question when they have to fight again have some particularly for jar jar i guess jar jar needs to deliver some real pearls of wisdom like you know even if you don't lean too heavily into the whole like past or anything just having him say something that makes total sense and legitimizes his reason for being there. Because yeah, right, so now, he's right be, now, they could have just dropped him off, you know? Yeah. So he's going to be a wise, retired warrior in the way that Yuda was in, uh, in um, Empire. Uh, and then moving on to Anakin, he's going to be... There's a lot of changes with this guy. He's going to be older. He's going to be potentially hobbled. He's going to be angry. And he's going to be shifty, and he's you know there there are hints of him being a danger. So he'll he'll kill someone. We even maybe even we don't know if it's intentional. Or not. He'll ram someone off in the pod race and kill them, and then conceal it. Um, and is Qui Gon going to be his daddy? <laughs> is this where we go? I I kind of want to go with it. <laughs> um, I even I know I pitched it, but I would be more inclined to just 
I I would definitely do the kind of the the uh, Shmi and Qui Gon have a look. They have a knowing look at each other that suggest across the table that suggests that there was a, a past between them. Um, I would heavily imply that without saying, without confirming that this past is what has prevented Qui Gon from climbing the ladder. Um, I would have it be heavily implied that he has been nurturing Anakin's ways for many years, but I would leave it a l- I would leave it vague enough so that both us and Anakin will want answers in Episode Two, because you need Anakin to want to pursue the truth, like the way Luke wants to pursue the truth uh, by the end of Empire Strikes Back. And there's no value to it if we already know everything. Yeah. And I think play the long game here. We know there's going to be episode two and three. Audiences will wait for you. Um, and right. yeah. Yeah, I, th- I think that's nice. I think the subtleness of it, just, just having a more of a link between Qui-Gon and, and Anakin is, is quite important here, it feels like, because it just it holds that thread together somehow. And then on, on to point five about the motivations to have Obi-Wan move into the, the full protagonist in the, in the structure of this, this, this film. You know, Qui-Gon can leave him with this potential secret. Again, we don't have to go into exactly what it is. He can just say, I want you to train the boy it's for you know it's it's my last dying i want you to train my boy it is to say my boy <laughs> and but putting putting the emphasis on obi-wan takes the pressure off other characters having to be better developed right now no one is really well developed and therefore you're looking for someone to kind of take the lead here in this story and i think you don't have that problem in attack of the clones now, people might not like that film either that much, but that, that isn't a problem in Attack of the Clones characterization. Um, for me, anyway, I think. I, I think they're more, they're more developed. Whereas in this, everyone's underdeveloped. And it's almost like they're... It, it, the danger, it feels like Lucas, when he was writing this, assumed, well, obviously the audience will gravitate towards Obi-Wan. Mm. But he doesn't do anything significant in the early stages to warrant us gravitating towards him. There's no Ellen Ripley moment where, you know, she's making all the smart decisions or anything like that to make us want to mm. align ourselves with him, with her. Uh, Qui- Obi-Wan is just following a lead. Qui-Gon is following the force. Everyone's just following coincidence. And you need, um, yeah, you need a leader in this pack uh, for the audience mm. to be able to attach themselves to. Qui- Obi- Obi-Wan doesn't need to be a leader in the story, but he needs to be the one who's leading this, us through the story um, on an arc of his own. So great. And I think if you, so it, it, I was going to say, if you do, sorry, all, if you do all that, I think you haven't actually affected the structure of the story. Like it's still a case of Naboo has been invaded where, you know, there's crisis in government. We're stranded on Tatooine for a while. We need a pod race, blah, blah, blah. And then we go back. Like we haven't touched the structure of the film. Yeah, or we haven't caught any yeah. characters either. Um, it's just I, w- I was about to, to to say that actually that I think this is the one of the the I, c- I guess least involved we've been with the structure. Like it's still all there. It, it it almost feels like we've done a second or third draft pass on the script to twiddle with it and and just you know get a few more things working. There's been a few changes with characters. Uh, personas and how much they're in the film, but otherwise it's still there, which for for me sort of shows that you know it, it is a good enough film to have made a lot a lot of money. It's just that it was almost a victim of its its own success, and there were a few decisions that could have been sl- made slightly different if there were more passes done on the script. A lot of look, a lot of the um, issues that we've talked about, you can find in other Star Wars properties. It's, you know, it's not unique to this Star Wars. I think people have this idea and this is no disrespect to Star Wars, but people have an, abs- an, an absurdly high kind of view of Star Wars in their minds. Um, and I think a lot of objectivity has been lost. And Star Wars is, like any great story, not perfect. Um, and that's OK. You know, we've talked about Lord of the Rings and eagles and all that. Like, there's always going to be something that you just, why, why did they do that? You know, or why didn't they do that instead? And, and, and Phantom Menace is just 
has just because it was the first one out of the gate, it's re- the one we're all targeting uh, or has been targeted for a long time. There's absolutely things that could be improved upon it. But I don't think the general vision for what this is was bad. I don't think the vision of Jar Jar Binks as this comedic kind of a quasi tragic character is bad because I saw the value that I had for young kids growing up. Um, but I, I do think as a screenwriter, there is more characterization to be put into that character. Yes, yeah, so, so. so um, I think it's just, it's just, yeah, let's do this. Let's do the next draft of that story rather than condemn it mm. all outright, you know? Um, anyway. Yeah, yeah I, th- I agree with, uh, with that, John. Um, I think we need to, uh, as with our other uh, George Lucas discussions, this has gone on for quite a while. I know. Um, so um, have you got any other thoughts before we, uh, before we end? These go on long because we love this property so much. I love Indiana Jones so much I can talk forever about it. And I love Star Wars so much I can talk forever about it. But the, uh, you know, talking about it means talking about the good stuff and the bad as well, doesn't it? Um, so, yeah. I, look, I, I think Phantom Menace it will always have its place. And I think the more Star Wars properties come out over the years, you know, it's never going to go away. Um Phantom Menace is going to become more significant, I think. You know, we're already seeing flashes of Jake Lloyd, for example, and seeing uh, comparisons to Jake Lloyd and young Luke in Obi-Wan Kenobi. You can see that from the trailer alone. Um, There is more and more value as time goes on to Phantom Menace and what it brings to the table. And if it's two hours, if it's the least interesting two hours of your, you know, 50 hour Star Wars experience or whatever, who cares? You know, there are boring scenes in Fellowship of the Ring. So um, who cares, you know? So anyway. <laughs> I think I mirror that, John. I think, you know, the, the Lucas properties are just fabulous things to, uh, to chat about. And yeah, we, have, we normally have a lot to say because we're such big fans. Um, so thanks. Thanks for that. That was a lot of fun. Um, and thanks for listening, guys. Uh, this has been The Great Hollywood Rewrite from The Script Department. Please check out our website at thescriptdepartment.net for more conversations like this. Take a look at our social media. The links are in the description. Find us wherever you get your podcasts. Just search for The Script Department and subscribe to the YouTube channel. If you've got any ideas of what film or TV show you'd like us to look at next week, just hit us up in the comments or message us directly. We look forward to hearing your suggestions. Nice one. Thank <laughs> you.